So I'm going to speak about imaging of the equine neck and back. So broadly speaking, neck pathology can be divided into neurological disease or a neck pain. And in neurological disease, we're including those horses that are characterized by spinal ataxia. And there's many different causes of this, with cervical vertebral malformation being one of them. But all of these topics have been fully discussed last year at this meeting, so I'm not going to go into too much detail into this side of things. I'm going rather to concentrate in neck pain and the type of neck pain that presents with a reduced range of motion of st or stiffness of the cervical spine, altered neck carriage or a difficulty grazing, but also difficulty in accepting the bit or working on an outline that then presents our, as our typical poor performance case and also neck pathology that can cause radiculopathy or impingement of the nerve roots from the lower uh, cervical or cranial thoracic spine that can then create a forelimb, limb, uh, forelimb gait abnormality or even a forelimb lameness. But overall, the take-home message is that the clinical signs of neck pathology are very varied and in a specific, and we don't fully understand uh, the whole picture. Back pain, on the other hand, has been uh, reported uh, more frequently and more thoroughly in the literature than neck pain has. And we know that's a common cause of poor performance and that it's frequently recurrent and associated with, with lameness, forelimb or hind limb lameness. And obviously it can also occur, occur following injury or trauma to the thoracolumbar spine. There's been a few studies over the years reporting the prevalence of back pain in horses. These are just a few examples. So in a group of around 800 horses presented for poor performance evaluation, uh, this group found that 25.8% of these horses presented with back pain associated with lameness, and 8.9% of these, horse, uh, these horses presented with back pain alone. In another group of horses, around 400 horses that presented for a pre-purchase exam, out of these horses, 6.8% were noted to have clinical signs of back pain. Severe osteospinal pathology has also been reported in thoroughbred racehorses in roughly 77% of them. And this was a post-mortem study that um, was examining horses that were uh, euthanized for reasons unrelated to back pain. And back-related problems have been reported in 25% of dressage horses. However, um, it was very much an owner-reported uh, situation and only 80% of these horses in this study um, were diagnosed by a veterinary surgeon. And we know with, you know, from several clinical and experimental studies that have been done involving the thoracolumbar spine that an induced lameness and or back pain or stiffness does alter the biomechanics of the top line and thoracolumbar spine. So the problem that we regularly faced with these horses is what is neck and back pain and we're well past the days that we thought that looking at a horse from an orthopedic point of view was establishing if it was lame or not lame. We know that you know there's a lot more to musculoskeletal pathology than a pathology that would create a fore or a hind limb lameness and the neck and back and back definitely play a big role in this category. Just like any other region or area of pathology in the body, uh, diagnostic imaging is very important, and that's what we're going to concentrate in this talk, is imaging of the neck and back. But it's very important as well, and you know, crucial really, for us to uh, correlate the imaging findings with not only the clinical signs, but also the clinical presentation of these horses. And the clinical signs, we're going to establish what are the clinical signs based on inspection, palpation and manipulation, dynamic examination, which in these cases is very useful to include ridden assessment and a combined team approach. Having the input of a physiotherapist or a chiropractor or an osteopath, if you work with, it, uh, with a group of people, it's good to have you know, different perspectives on, uh, on the same case. So when it's just this slide is just here to remind us like how important it is to to look at the bigger picture and not only you know zoom in into the different areas but look at the horse as a whole and look from all different uh, perspectives because you know different sites would tell us different things and if we zoom in then in different areas then we can establish like in this pony that there is a, a poor muscle development or a, uh, muscle atrophy of the lower neck muscles and the cranial uh, shoulder muscles, 
Or we can look at other horses and establish that it's not so much the neck, but it's more the thoracolumbar spine that's involved, or the gluteals or the hamstrings, and to a mild, moderate, or severe degree. Conformation is also important, so having a lordotic kyphosis or scoliosis of the back, all of these things, they, you know, there hasn't been a study correlating this with different pathologies as such, but we can imagine that different shapes, like in the same way that different shapes of the limbs would create different uh, loading of the limbs, we, we have to assume that the same happens within the, the thoracal and the spine. And asymmetries is another thing that we look at these horses. So is it like a soft tissue asymmetry? Is it a bony asymmetry? Or is it both? And all of these things you know, give us a, can give us a clue as to what's the underlying pathology, like a tubercoxy fracture on the horse on the right-hand side or ileal shaft fracture on the horse on the left. Uh, palpation and manipulation. I don't think there's two people in this room that do this exactly the same. I think it's... Um, it's very variable and we all have our own tricks or our way of doing it, but I think the main thing is being thorough and knowing, you know, and starting one end, finishing in the other, but also knowing exactly what, we're trying to est what you're trying to establish with each of the tests. Is it extension of the thoracolumbar spine that you're testing? Is it flexion of the lumbar sacral region? All of these things with wi each individual test that you do, it's, it's very important no matter which way you go around doing it. So the main things that we're assessing, I sort of look at this in um, this way, really. Like, there's three things that I'm assessing with each test that uh, I'm performing in a horse. And the first thing would be discomfort. Is the horse giving me a clear sign that is uncomfortable with the palpation that I'm doing in a certain area or the manipulation test that we're doing? And that's a yes or a no. And then the muscle tone. If the horse is not giving you a pain reaction, but instead you have a significant degree of muscle spasm that's already giving you information from what's happening with that region of what's the reaction or more local reaction of the horse to uh, what you're doing. And also, obviously, the range of motion, it's very important, both of individual uh, joints or anatomical parts or, you know, as a whole. And the conclusions really is, are, is there pain, yes or no? And is it the neck or is it the back? And what's the grade of the pain? And the grade can be defined as simply as mild, moderate, severe. Or you can you know, get a little bit more fancy and use things like pressure algometry or visual analog scales. There are several different ways of documenting pain. No, you know, no single one of them is the perfect one. So, uh, but you just need to have your method, your own method to establish if you think it's mild, moderate or severe. And also, obviously, the most affected regions. If there's more than one, also, what do you think, you know, have a list of priorities? What do you think it's the most clinically relevant for the horse in that specific moment, or what's the least clinically relevant for the horse? Anatomy of the neck, we're just going to have a brief uh, talk about anatomy before we go into imaging. So we all know that there are seven, uh, seven cervical vertebra. The atlas and the axis have a fairly unique shape. You can't really confuse them with, with the other cervical vertebra. It's more between C3 and C7 that we have a more standard shape to these, um, to these vertebras. So they all have uh, cranial and caudal articular processes. So, um, and we have then the vertebral uh, foramen and also the transverse foramen on, on the side. And uh, the dorsal lamina at the top and then the vertebral body and at the, uh, the cranial aspect and caudal aspect, you'll have the, um, the parts that will form the intercentral joints. Uh, important to know is that, you know, the transverse processes from C3 to C5, uh, or even to uh, the transverse processes in general, really, have a cranial or ventral tubercle and a caudal or dorsal uh, tubercle. And we'll go to going to discuss these a little bit further when we look at neck radiographs. Going down to the lower neck, there are a few uh, variations in these vertebrae. So the transverse processes of um, C5 to C6, or C3 to C5 in comparison to C6, C6 are, are slightly different. So in C6, the uh, ventral tubercle has a caudal extension, which we know as the ventral lamina of C6, and that will be uh, one of the easiest thing to identify C6, or C6 on radiographs. And, uh, but this is, happens in the majority of horses, but not all of them. 
uh, but in the great majority, C6 will have a ventral laminae. The transverse process of C6 will also be a little bit shorter if you compare it here with C5, for example. You can see that's a little bit, you know, a more condensed structure. structure. Uh, going down to C7, it has a more uh, well-developed dorsal spinous process, and there is a huge anatomical variation on this dorsal spinous process of C7. It's normally you know, more well-developed than the previous vertebrae, but it's there, you know, there is um, a couple of papers describing how, uh, how much anatomical variation in shape and size of, of this area there is. C7 also has a shorter vertebral body and a smaller or shorter transverse process process in comparison to the other vertebra. Going to the soft tissues of the neck, uh, we have the nuchal ligament, and the nuchal ligament is uh, constituted by two parts, the funicular part and a laminar part. The funicular part of the nuchal ligament is very much a cord-like structure that goes from the top of the dorsal spinous processes of the withers to the external pro uh, occipital protuberance and the skull. So it's very much, you know, you could say that you know, the true nuchal ligament is this cord-like structure. Then the laminar part of the, of the nuchal ligament is more like a fascia-like structure that literally divides the right and the left-hand side of the neck musculature. So it's very much midline. And it doesn't, this uh, laminar part has been described in a fairly recent study that it doesn't have an attachment to the dorsal aspect of C6 and C7. Nuchal bursa, we have three. Uh, two of them are consistently present and one of them not, pre not always present in every horse. So the cranial uh, nuchal bursa is consi consistently present over C1. The caudal cervical nu nuchal, nuchal bursa is inconsistently present over C2. And then we have a third uh, supraspinous bursa which is consistently present over the withers around uh, T3. Uh, muscles of the neck, I'm um, not going to go into too much detail, but we have, they're divided in three different layers, superficial, mid, middle, and deep layer. On the superficial layer, we have the trapezius and the ulnar transversus muscle, and then the deeper layers, we have the splenius, which occupies pretty much the whole of the neck, the longissimus and its different components, and the semispinalis capitis muscle. This is just a quick reminder of uh, the brachial plexus and the nerve roots that, uh, that are involved in forming this brachial plexus. And this is going to be you know, one of the main causes why, uh, the reasons why neck problems can then lead to uh, radiculopathies. Moving on to the back, uh, we have uh, 18 thoracic vertebra and six lumbar vertebra. As, um, as a clinical comment, so T3 is usually the first palpable uh, dorsal spinous process. T5 or T4-5 is usually the highest, and these things, you know, they're not, it's not always the case, and it depends on the shape of the horse and the conformation, but uh, it's useful to know, to have an idea of these things when we're looking at radiographs and at horses. And T10 is usually said to be the end of the withers, and T15, the anticlinal vertebra, so they're sort of marked here with asterisks. Looking at the bones of the thoracic spine, we'll look first at the thoracic spine and then the lumbar spine. In the thoracic spine, you can see that there is a progressive enlargement and size in the dorsal spinous process up to 4-5, and then a progressive decrease in the size of the dorsal spinous process, which in between T10 and T18 is fairly similar. The transverse processes and mammillary processes of these vertebrae get progressively more prominent in the cranial to caudal direction in the thoracic spine, being most prominent in the caudal thoracic. Uh, regarding the articular process joints, they start with a very, fairly uh, horizontal conformation and get more and more angulated as you go back the thoracic spine. And this is something that you'll be able to appreciate with, uh, on radiographs as well. Within the lumbar spine, so there's a similar siphon shape to the dorsal spinous processes. There is a similar, you know, size and shape to the mammillary processes as well. And, uh, and then instead of having the costal vertebral joints that then articulate with the, with the ribs, we're going to have the transverse processes in these vertebra. Ligaments of the back, we're just going to briefly talk about the supraspinous and the interspinous ligaments. And muscles of the back, they can be divided in epaxial and hypaxial muscles, epaxial being 
the dorsal musculature dorsal to the vertebral body and being responsible for extension of the back or lateral flexion of the back if unilaterally con contracted. And the hypaxial muscle, uh, musculature being responsible for uh, flexion of the thoracolumbar spine or, unilat or uh, lateral flexion if uh, unilateral contraction. So muscles of the back can also be divided into three different layers. The most superficial one, again, trapezius, but the um, thoracic part, and the latissimus dorsi, which is the most superficial and bigger one. And then the deeper layer is the one that we normally call, you know, the true epaxial muscles, or, you know, the w ones that we normally are talking about when we're talking about epaxial musculature, which is the longissimus, the multifidus, and the iliocostalis. And here's just do a cross-section area to, to uh, have an idea of how uh, these muscles uh, lay um, you know, on the horse when we see it. This is pretty similar to what you would get with an ultrasound image. So if you look at the T18, you can see that within the dorsal spinous process on the side, the, the muscle that's closest to the DSB is the multifidus muscle. Then this big muscle uh, on the side is the longissimus, and then you have the iliocostalis there. If you move qu further cranially for around uh, T6 level, you would have other muscles coming into pray, uh, to place, like the scapulohumeral, uh, muscles or the muscles in that region, like the trapezius and the rhomboideus, re represented here as four and five. And as you move further caudally in the thoracolumbar spine, you have the medial gluteal muscle being superimposed with the uh, longissimus muscle at, in, the, in the caudal lumbar spine. So the hypaxial muscle, they are mainly the iliopsoas complex uh, formed by the major psoas, iliac muscle and minor psoas, and also, but also the abdominal musculature can be considered high, uh, hypaxial muscles. So starting now with imaging, for radiography, uh, you need an X-ray generator with an output capacity around 70 to 120 kV and 20 to 100 MAS. With a portable X-ray machine, we can do a fairly decent job and get good quality images in the cranial neck, some horses in the middle neck, and of the dorsal spinous processes of the back. But really, if we want to have good quality images with the, within the lower neck or having a good look at articular process joints or vertebral bodies of, of the thoracolumbar spine, you need a gantry-mounted X-ray system. And the new DR systems sort of, you know, are, some of them are better than this and, this, and you can do it with a portable, but, you know, generally speaking, you do need a gantry-mounted mount, system to achieve the exposures that you require to have good quality images of this region. I would say that a large plate is almost, almost essential from my point of view and to image these areas. And one reason is quite simple is radi radiation protection. So if you have a large plate or a little plate, you can imagine, you know, the number of x-rays that you need to do to image a horse from top to bottom is quite different. Um, but also because it's an area that's very important to have perspective and to see what's the alignment of the vertebral canal and to compare cranial and caudal uh, articular process joints, for example, to compare the size uh, between them. And the plates stand both, you know, to avoid movement and but also uh, for radiation protection. You don't want someone, you know, holding a plate when you're firing at 100 or kV or a 90 MAS. Technique, so for the neck, you have a lateral lateral view, which it's the standard uh, view of the neck. So with this view, you can image the vertebral body, vertebral canal, dorsal lamina, etc. And then you have a lateral ventral lateral dorsal oblique view, which for the neck is usually between 45 and 55 degrees, less angulation if you're in the lower cervical spine. And this view is used to highlight and separate the right and the left articular process joints and the transverse processes as well. Within the back, it's a similar scenario. So you have a lateral, lateral view that you can image, uh, have a standard view, or you have a lateral, ventral, lateral, dorsal oblique that in the case of the back is 20 degrees instead of the 45, 55 that you are using in the neck. And in this view for the back, it's mainly used once to, again, to highlight and separate the articular process joints from the right and the left-hand side, uh, um, but mainly in the, in the caudal thoracic uh, region. But you sort of need to have, you know, the lung field to be able to image these areas. So it's useful for the caudal thoracic region. 
So no more radiographs of uh, cervical spine. So C1 and C2, as we were saying, they are fairly unique shape. So C1 doesn't have a vertebral body, has a ventral and a dorsal uh, lamina, has the ailer foramen there, and then the wings are superimposed in the lateral, lateral view. C2 has a more elongated vertebral body and articulates with C1 uh, through the dens. And then it has the lateral foramen there, which in some horses it doesn't always, you know, close the cranial aspect. It can be uh, opened, this, this cranial side. And then it has a very prominent and well-defined dorsal spinous process. Moving on to the mid portion of the neck, so we are at the level of C4, 5, 6. And you can see that triangular shape caused by the cranial tubercle and the caudal tubercle of the transverse processes of C5. And then you have a nice view of the intervertebral foramen, where there are nerve roots who are going to come out. Articular process joints, similar sort of size, and not interfering with the intervertebral foramen. Intercentral central joints, so a nice uh, definition of the chondral plate in the body. Then we have the ventral lamina of the vertebral body. And it's interesting to see in this view that you can see the difference in shape in the transverse process of C5 in comparison to C6 that then has the ventral extension here, the ventral lamina. And you can see that better here on this uh, specimen here on the, on the right hand side. So moving on to the lower neck, uh, so C6 in, uh, and C6, C7, and C7, T1. So in this case, so in this specimen, you see that C7 has a fairly prominent dorsal spinous process, not so much in this horse, in this radiograph. You can barely see the dorsal spinous process of C7. So as, we, uh, as I said earlier, it, it, there is a huge amount of anatomical variation in this area. And the same thing for C6. So we we're saying that the ventral lamina is you know, normally present, but in this case, for example, I don't know if you can see it at the back, but there's transposition of the ventral lamina of C6 onto C7 on this radiograph. And there's been a study trying to establish a correlation between this finding and osteoarthritis and CVM or clinical signs of neck pain. And the only thing that was found in that study is that these horses with transposition of the ventral lamina of C6 onto C7 appear to be more predisposed to have clinical signs of neck pain. So here's a normal view of uh, oblique view of the neck. So you can see how you can very nicely separate the right and the left uh, articular process joints. So in this, this is a left ventral, so the, what you'll have here at the top is going to be the left articular process joint, and what you're going through and seeing through the joint space is on the right-hand side. So you can see that you can see the joint margins, you could comment on periarticular modeling or fragmentation, you can also have an impression of the subchondral bone plate and what is happening uh, from that respect. So this is going through the joint space, so we have the caudal articular process here of C5, cranial articular process of C6, and joint space there. And then you can see that you have, you know, you can see nicely the transverse process on the side, and then you could do the same by doing, you know, instead of the left ventral, looking at the right ventral, and you'll have the other, um, you know, the other side of the neck. So just like any other area that we radiograph, it's very important that we're very critical about our image quality. And I think for the neck, that's especially important. Uh, you know, not especially important, it's important everywhere, really. But you wouldn't, or you shouldn't, be taking any sort of intervertebral measurements from the next ray with this quality, or making comments about the size of the articular processes in these vertebrates. It's a very oblique and not a true lateral radiograph. So you really, you know, you need to be critical about the image quality that you have before you start making any sort of um, comments about these images. So that with the neck, that's that's very important, and you know, exposure is also important, obviously. So I'm just going to go through a few clinical cases for radiographs of the neck. This is a fairly interesting one. Uh, it's a pony that presented with uh, neck pain and it didn't do anything. It was literally a companion pony that lived out in the field and one day it was noted that it couldn't eat grass or lower the head to, uh, to eat. So it, had, it, it literally had to be fed from a height and was unable to move its neck in all four planes. <laughs> And if you look at the neck base of this, uh, of this horse, you can see, you know, you could comment that there is enlargement of the articular process joint between C6 and C7, there. And, but there's a part of the vertebral body of C7 that you're not able to image because superimposition with a supraglenoid tubercle there. So by changing the position 
the neck position just by further extending the neck of this horse, then you can see that there is a completely abnormal intracentral joint in this pony that explains a lot better the clinical signs that uh, he was presented with. So you can see that this joint and disc are completely compromised. And it was just interesting to see the difference between you know, what an X-ray like this can tell you for this sort of cases or an X-ray like this can tell you. This is another case. So again, you could comment on enlargement of the articular process joints between C5 and C6 and between C6 and C7. But another thing that sort of jumps at us in this radiograph is that there's almost like an extra radiolucent line there. So it's, you can't, it's poorly defined what would be the joint space and then there's almost another extra line that you can see there and you might think what is causing this radiolucent um, line there. And when you do oblique radiographs, this is one of the situations that it is quite useful. So you can see first, you know, the difference in size. So if you see the size, we're at the same level here and here. So if you see the difference in size between the left articular process joints and the right articular processes, you can see that that's, you know, significantly bigger. So you can, with this radiograph, you can establish which one is actually enlarged. The other thing that you can see, it's see this radiolucent line there. And this is a horse with a poor performance. There was no... Um, acute signs of neck pathology like suggesting that there has been a recent fracture. It could be effectively an old fracture or it could be like an uh, osteochondral um, type fragment within the, um, this specific joint. And here are just some examples of uh, osteoarthritis of the lower neck with enlargement of the tickler process joints from you know, a mild case to a more obvious case. And here is just an example of trauma to the neck. We have the scintigraphy images here, and we can see um, that there is increased radiopharmaceutical uptake in, well, looking at the X-ray, I can tell you that's the transverse process of, um, of C3, but, uh, but that's the sort of region that we have, and also in the articular processes of C, uh, 67 and C71. So you can see the fracture line there on the transverse process of C3, and you can see also that there is an, an individual fragment there on between C7 and T1 in this horse. So it's a case that is it's nicely to nice to correlate the scintigraphy findings with the radiographic findings. Uh, talking about back radiographs, I look at this x-ray and I only think, like, I wish. I wish that we had this definition. I wish we were able to image uh, an adult horse that we're, like, we, we are able to image a two weeks old foal in this image. So it's not quite the case and we have to get around it somehow. So cranial thoracic spine, um, this is normally how it looks like. So the dorsal spinous process have separate center of ossification within the cranial withers region, and that's just normal. The same thing in this specimen here. Uh, the vertebral bodies can be, you can have a really good idea of the vertebral bodies in the thoracic spine, not so much in the lumbar and spine, but that's again the contrast given by the lung field, which is very useful. Uh, you can also see the ribs, but Billy will talk to you about rib fractures and pathology, so I won't go into that. But something that's interesting to note in the thoracolumbar spine and the limitations of radio, uh, radiography in a way is you can see if you want to make comments about the articular process joints in this, uh, at this level, you see there's, they're completely superimposed with the ribs. So it's very difficult to make any sort of meaningful comments about what's happening in the articular process joints versus the cranial portion of the withers because they're very much superimposed in the lateral, lateral view. And that's when the oblique view can be useful or also ultrasonography. Uh, middle to caudal thoracic, so, you know, dorsal spinous processes, it's, um, you know, we've, we've all seen... Uh, radiographs of the DSPs, and this specimen is not quite normal, has an area of impingement there, but you can see from this specimen that, again, we have an increase in angulation of the articular process joints from cranial to caudal uh, thoracic spine, and T10 would probably be uh, <coughs> around here in this image, either one or the other, um, and, you know, it's what is considered the end of the withers. So normal oblique views of the back. So the articular process joints would be, the joint space would be here and here. You can see their superimposition with the, with the transverse and mammillary process there, which are these structures here on this specimen. But also that you can have a good idea not only of one joint to the right and the left, but also of the cranial portion of the ribs, which is a lot easier than seeing it on the lateral, lateral view. 
moving on to the lumbar spine, I didn't mention when we were talking about radiography earlier in the technique, but there's the, there are these aluminium wedges that are very useful if you want to reduce the amount of radiographs that you need to do to image a back in a way that if you have the exposures that you need to have a good look at the articular process joints, like in this view, you're going to have clipping artifacts of the dorsal spinous processes. So the aluminium wedge, if you use that, then that will enable you to, with what with the same radiographic view in the higher exposure, to be able to have a good image of the dorsal spinous processes and the articular process joints. So in the lumbar spine, it's a lot easier to radiographically comment on the articular process joints because they have this typical triangular shape. You can see them clearly. There's no, you know, the ribs are not there in the middle. They're not there, you know, they just have superimposition between the right and the left side. And you can have a good view as well of the, of the transverse processes. So, you know, depending on the side of the horse, you can get a pretty decent uh, image of this area as well. So image quality, just like the neck, is very important. And you wouldn't comment anything on the vertebral bodies in this x-ray, would you? You can comment about, you know, the summits of the dorsal spinous process, maybe. But if you wanted to make any comments of the vertebral bodies or see, you know, if there's any sort of disc pathology or vertebral body pathology, then you need a higher exposure and a better quality radiograph. Same thing with the dorsal spinous processes. And it's important that... Yes, you can diagnose impingement with this radiograph, but you need to have more information. You need to have not just the summits of the dorsal spinous process, but the whole of the dorsal spinous process, because that will make a difference clinically, but also in the surgical approach that's given. If the surgeon is just going to do a wedge osteotomy or, you know, a partial or a complete. So it is important to see the whole picture and to see from top to bottom the dorsal spinous process and not just the very top of them. So kissing spines, we've all seen an x-ray with, uh, with kissing spines. I'm not going to lose too much time with this. There's uh, several grading scales to uh, radiographically grade the kissing spines, and this is an example of one of them. And they're all based in basically the degree of impingement or narrowing of the interspinous space or the, or the degree of modeling that is present in, um, yes. in the cortical margins of the dorsal spinous processes. And here is just a clinical example, this uh, of uh, spondylosis, ventral spondylosis. You can see, um, you know, its uh, appearance on scintigraphy and also on the radiograph of the thoracic spine. Moving on to ultrasonography. So uh, these are the main three probes that uh, will be used for, ultras uh, for ultrasound of the neck and back. From a diagnostic point of view and to document, you know, what is happening, it's, and, you know, have a look diagnostically, it's the one that you're going to be using more would be the macro convex probe. Obviously, if there's something that you want to look into more detail or more superficial uh, soft tissue structures or, or bony structures, then the linear probe is very useful as well. The micro convex is useful more for ultrasound guided injections and to help with medication. But from an imaging point of view, diagnostically, then, you know, the other two are the main two that are going to be used. What we're going to be able to image within the neck is the nuchal ligament and neck muscles, the cervical intervertebral articular process joints, the transverse processes and the vertebral bodies. We can have a pretty good look at the ventral aspect of the vertebral bodies, etc. Within the back, we're going to have a look at the supraspinous ligament and the apaxial muscles and the thoracic and lumbar articular process joints, the transverse uh, processes and the costal vertebral joints and ribs. So this is, you know, pretty much everything that you can image with ultrasound. Starting with the nuchal area, so uh, reasons to image this area is like a swelling uh, or a muscle asymmetry in this region and or pain in this region reported by the rider or the physiotherapist or that you found in your own clinical assessment. And the common pathologies in this area, it's either a cranial enthesiopathy of the nuchal ligament or semispinalis capitis tendon of insertion or a nuchal bursitis or a dystrophic mineralization or an abscess, you know, or a different uh, or even tendinopathy of the, te of the semispinalis capitis tendon. So what we can see in this image, we can see, so the nuchal ligament is off incidence in this image. So we're around this area and the nuchal ligament is off incidence and we can see the tendon, the left and right tendon of insertion of the semispinalis capitis muscle. And then we have the dorsal oblique, uh, the dorsal rectus, sorry, uh, musculature and the dorsal oblique 
um, cavities muscle, the oblique cavities muscle, sorry, within this region here. So this is a transverse section, and we have a longitudinal section on the right-hand side comparing uh, left and right. So the main ligamentous structures that you see on each side are the semispinalis cavities tendon, and I found that's most, you know, it, it's not very common to have pathology in this area, but I would, you know, say that this, uh, that tendinopathy of this tendon is probably more common than nuchal ligament dysmopathy on its own. So moving on with ultrasound uh, further down the neck, so then you get into C1 and C2. And C1 it's, and C2, you can see C1 is on the left-hand side of this image, C2 is on the right-hand side. In the middle, you have very much the subarachnoid space and the spinal cord. So you can see the spinal cord there and the subarachnoid space there, which would be if you wanted to collect CSF where you would go. And you can do this in the standing sedated horse, and there's been a paper describing this technique very neatly so that then the needle would be introduced ventrally to your ultrasound probe and you could collect um, the cerebral sp uh, spinal fluid. And this is also a good site to know, to position yourself on ultrasound, to know where you're starting. Then you can count down from C1 to C2 once you have, once you have this reference, Im reference image, or from C7 T1, but we'll get that in a minute. So the standard view of uh, an articular process joint in the vertebral body on ultrasound would be, you know, pretty much like this. So you tend to, you should position yourself perpendicular to the long axis of the neck. I don't say vertical or degrees. I think the way to think about it is depend on the head, head position is to try to be perpendicular to the long axis of the neck. And what you're aiming to see is the caudal articular process of the cranial vertebra, this case C5, the joint space just there, and then the cranial articular process of the C6 in this case, or the, the caudal vertebra. And then you can, you're can you also able to see the, tr the transverse processes and the vertebral artery. And the vertebral artery, which goes from here from the transverse foramen, is quite important in knowing your positioning in the neck, especially when you're going to make comments about size or enlargement of the articular process joints. So this would be a pretty standard view of the neck. And then as we move further distally and as we get to C71, then anatomy changes a bit, which is useful, again, if we want to uh, <coughs> see where we are or see if we're imaging C67 or C71. So at the level of C71, then as we said earlier, C7 doesn't have a, a transverse foramen. So the ver vertebral artery just come from C comes from C6 and then it sort of continues further distally. So in most ultrasound images, you won't be able, you won't be able to see the, the vertebral artery sitting there closely to uh, the articular process joints of C71. You either not see it or see it further distally there in an oblique way. What you will be able to see, though, is the deep cervical artery, which will be positioned dorsally to C71. So it's that artery there. So if I put my probe there where the yellow line is, you can see that level C71, you have the deep cervical artery that you will be able to image at this level. And then from here again, you can count further cranially to know what to position yourself within the neck. So as we said, uh, placement of the probe will be perpendicular to the long axis of the neck, and that's the standard image. You can also image things separately. So it's not just that way that you need to look at the neck. So you can look at each articular process like individually. So you can look at the cranial articular process. And if you're trying to identify fragments, this is very useful. And you can look at the caudal articular process, depending how you position your probe, or even at the joint space, or at the transverse processes, or at the ventral aspect of the vertebral body. So that's, that's the beauty of ultrasound, is how we can image you know, pretty almost 360 around the the vertebral, um, the, um, the vertebral, um, the vertebras. So clinical cases. So I will emphasize the care here when we're trying to comment on the enlargement of the articular process when you're doing an ultrasound. Mainly because as you tilt your probe, you can make the joint look as big as or as small depending on how you're positioning or in the cranial aspect or caudal aspect. So I think, you know, it's sometimes you need to be brave to sort of like make a call on ultrasound. Sometimes it's very obvious, uh, but not always. But the vertebral artery sort of helps you with that. If you have a clear transverse section of the vertebral artery, you'll, you can, you know, you can have an idea that um, you're in the same, you have a, a comparable image from the left and the right, and then you could comment potentially on enlargement. But that's something, you know, that's a lot easier to establish with x-ray. 
And then uh, periarticular modeling or osteochondral fragments, then that, again, within the neck, especially from three, uh, C3 to C5, there can, the vertebra can have quite pronounced capsule, capsular and muscular attachments, which can look pretty much like a fragment or, you know, like an osteophyte. So there, ne there needs to be care, and all of these need, needs to be, you know, um, look in combination with the other uh, findings, but you could uh, visualize a small um, fragment with ultrasound. Obviously, if you have a, a you know a, a bigger fragment, then you know you you can see it on ultrasound. You can see it in X-ray. You know there's it's not very difficult. It's a lot more easier when you have bigger fragments within the joints. So normal ultrasound of the back. Uh, we have a normal ultrasound view here of the thoracic spine. So very prominent mammillary process. Uh, co convex appearance of the ribs, and then we have the multifidus muscle there and longissimus there, and the thoracolumbar fascia at the top. Moving to the lumbar spine, then we can see that the miller processes, processes are not that uh, prominent, and it very much looks like a chair there, and it's a very you know horizontal like uh, structure here at the at the um, where the articular process joint will be. And the joint is located pretty much in the middle between the mammillary process and the dorsal spinous process. So you can see it here, the same thing in the specimen there. And you can image, image this both on transverse and longitudinal views. Uh, supraspinous ligaments, so we have normal on the left and abnormal on the right. This is a transverse section. You need to have, you know, the dorsal spinous processes to see that you're in midline and not just off and imaging the thoracolumbar fascia. And and then this is a longitudinal view and you have normal images on the top and abnormal images on the bottom. You know, the clinical significance of this, it's, you know, it's difficult to establish and there's been just one study, I think from 2007 coming out of Cambridge and they found that around 68% of the horses had these lesions between T14 and T17 but they couldn't correlate the ultrasonographic appearance of the supraspinous ligament to clinic to horses with back pain or free of back pain. So it's difficult to establish the significance of supraspinous ligament pathology. So clinical cases of the back, these you know, could not be seen radiographically, they could be picked up on scintigraphy. So mild cases of osteoarthritis of the articular process joints or periarticular modeling. So there, a little bit there potentially, and here as well in comparison to the other side. And then more obvious cases with more active and more convincing modeling and new bone formation uh, closer to these joints. And these ones, you know, you hope that you, with, with the radiographic systems that we have available, that you, you are able to see these on, on X-ray. So just to finish, just a normal uh, uh, scintigraphic study of the cervical and thoracolumbar spine. So within the cervical spine, you can there's a fairly homogeneous uh, ready pharmaceutical uptake between the different different cervical vertebra, and then you have uh, between C1 and C2, it normally can be uh, increased at the, this level, but that's you know within normal. Within the back, the cranial dorsal spinous processes of thoracic spine, the those um, separate centers of ossification will always look. Uh, seem to have an increased uh, radiopharmaceutical uptake, but within the mid-thoracic and caudal thoracic, you almost can't see the summits of the dorsal spinous process in a normal uh, scintigraphic study. And here are just a few examples of abnormal um, bone scan images. So we have a spondylosis here. We saw this case earlier. Mm -hmm. Then a typical case of impingement of the dorsal spinous processes. Typical case of osteoarthritis of the articular process joints. Then two different cases of not only increased rid of pharmaceutical uptake, but also enlargement of the profile of the articular process joints between C6 and C7. And the future really is 3D imaging, is, is having, is being able to e image these areas as well as we can in small animals. And we're not quite there yet. We're making huge progresses with the neck. We're not quite there with the back, but uh, we'll get there eventually. And you know, that's where we're heading. Thank you very much.